Welcome to the Pastor Study here on Smooth and WHOB iHeartRadio right here, y'all, on Facebook Live. And you're with us today. We got almost everybody that's that's here today. But but we're, I'm surprised because you got one of the females that's here. And this, normally the Wonder Twins, they stay together. But, you know, they're not the thing. So we want to recognize who we have with us today. Commonwealth Attorney for the City of Hampton. He's on Court TV. He's also on another show on this on on WHOB. I ain't gonna name no names. Right, well, he should be with us right. exclusively. I ain't gonna name no names. Stop hating, bro. He cheating. Stop he cheating, hating, bro. He's moonlighting on the past to study. Okay, I ain't gonna say no names, but we just gonna call it Commonwealth Attorney of the City of Hampton. Pastor Law, Anton Bell is with us. We have Bishop Ray Johnson, the Media Outreach Worship Center. He's in the building, and ladies and gentlemen. We have D Squared that, that is with us today. That, that's her that's her new name. Dr. Alvin Lyons Doctor. She has not one but two doctoral degrees. That's her again while we went to school, while we worked so hard. So oh. we go to school. Y'all raised me right. You raised me right. And last but not least, our producer extraordinaire, Jason Covington, who's working behind the scenes and with us today. So we got everybody here, Delegate Marcia Price. She's out. Handling her business, you know, this is election season. So we know y'all, y'all got to exercise your right to vote. On this show, we can't tell you who to vote for. But what we will tell you is that if you don't vote, y'all know the deal. You 100% trifle. trifle. <laughs> Let's get to the show today. Because we want to we wanna, we wanna make voting plain and why it's so important. And there's some new information that just came out in an article in Newsweek. Um, and you need to check this article out. Uh, Commonwealth Attorney Bell brought this to our attention. And what this is talking about is African-American populations in our country. First of all, let me just say, African-Americans only make up at most 14% of the United States population. That's less around 40, that. less than that. It's right at 13, mm -hmm. 14%. 13. So that, that's, mm -hmm. that's roughly around 40 42 million people on average, that's black people. But when you start looking at incarceration rates compared to the perspective of how many African-Americans are in our country, the rates are overwhelmingly off. And that's what we want to talk about today. So this, this article in Newsweek comes out, Alexandria Hutzler made this article on October the 13th and did a study on states that have way less than uh, the African-American population that has incarcerated 50% or higher in their states. Mm -hmm. So I just wanna mention some of these states to y'all so y'all know there are 12 states in the land where there is an incarceration rate of African-Americans at 50% or higher in their state. But again, I did tell you only 13% of the US 14 at most of the US population is black. But in their states, 50% of the people in prison or more are black. That's a problem. Yeah. Let me name these states to you all. Alabama, Delaware, Georgia, Illinois, Louisiana, Maryland, Michigan, Mississippi, ain't no surprise, New Jersey, North Carolina, South Carolina, and ladies and gentlemen, for the jury, Virginia is on that list. Pastor Law, you brought this to us, man. This is this is surprising, but then in some cases it's not surprising, but over 50% of those incarcerated in the state of Virginia are Black, even though the United States of Black people is at 13%. What is going on in these states and one that we live in where the black incarceration rates are so high. Well, you gotta ask yourself, what is the driving force behind these incarceration rates? And for listeners, you know, some people are gonna go automatically to some of the hotbed issues such as race, cultural, classism, socioeconomics, all of that. That plays a major role in it. And I will say, yes, is our judicial system uh, racially um, unequal? Absolutely, no question. If you come in this system with 
access, money, with um, certain class status uh, and white privilege, there is a greater likelihood that you could get a better outcome than someone who will come into the system as a poor black person, no question about it. Stats back it up. But let's flip that coin. The other coin is we do have great violence taking place in our community. And we've talked about that many times. And so the question is, is this statistic, is this percentage, is it being driven by the race or is it being driven by the fact we killing each other like we lost our minds? And we are killing each other like we've lost our minds. So I would say it's a combination of things. But this is the thing that has been bothering me the most since I read this article. I, I, I read recently some news um, captions concerning a young African-American male in Florida, 22 years old, who was arrested for manslaughter because his living girlfriend was on a Zoom and she was uh, on a business Zoom uh, for work. And they have two toddlers. And one of the toddlers was seen behind her making some movement. And the next thing you know, there was a loud pop. And then suddenly the workers, co-workers noticed there was blood on her face and then she fell backwards. Well, they called 911 and asked them to go do a um, welfare check on her. Meanwhile, the boyfriend comes home and he discovers his girlfriend lying in a pool of blood. He calls 911 and he's frantic. He's, 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 he's upset, clearly, no question. And he's screaming, please get here, hurry up, please get here, there's blood everywhere, there's blood everywhere. He's just telling them, please get here, there's blood everywhere. They tell him to do CPR, he's trying, but eventually, unfortunately, she does die. Come to find out, their toddler got his hand on a gun that was loaded in a Paw Patrol bag that was on the floor, got the, got the gun and shot his mom in the head and killed him. They charged him with manslaughter and they charged him with um, not properly storing a loaded firearm. Now, technically, you could potentially get to manslaughter, but is that the right thing to do? And that's the thing that's been bothering me ever since I have read that story and ever since I have read about that particular young man. As the Commonwealth attorney, your job is absolutely public safety. The question is, when you're doing your job, you have to make sure you balance those scales. Make sure you're doing it in a way that is just for the entire community. Now, was having that gun on that floor in a loaded gun where those kids could get to it, was, that, was it reckless? Absolutely, absolutely. And guess what? He is paying a price because the mother of his children someone who he was living with, and clearly, you know, they show photos and everything of them. Clearly, they were raised in a family. So he's paying a terrible price. He will have to live with that for the rest of his life. But the question is, should I now take him away from his children or take him away from society as someone who should not be a part of society because he made a reckless decision or failed to make a better sound decision. And that's the problem I'm having because in many of these states, you're not gonna tell me that they're not gonna be prosecutors who are making these same decisions and they are erring on the side of locking them up versus dealing with what caused you to make the poor judgment call. Because see, to me, that's not, criminal intent. To me, that's just poor judgment. And there's a difference. So that's, so, that's, 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 that's a difference. So you suggesting then that um, you think that he was charged because he was black? Like if he wasn't black, do you think that he may not have been charged 
and, and that kind of goes into why these rates in these states are so much higher, perhaps, than other states? I seriously question it. I seriously question it. I can't say because I, I'm not there and I don't have all the facts 100% and I'm not in the head of that prosecutor who made that decision, but I have to absolutely question it. When I look at the facts, when I look at what they are alleging has taken place and nothing else has been alleged to have taken place, then I have to absolutely question what motivated you to believe that he needs to be removed from our society or making a choice or a judgment call that has all impacted him in a very detrimental way versus having him get dealt with with some treatment because he's gonna always have to deal with the memory of that loved one being taken out of his and out of the lives of his children because he didn't have more, sa more safety protocols in place in his home. It's, it's just different. And, and I have to question why. And I know in my heart, I, I know what I feel, but can I prove it? No, but I know exactly what I feel because I'm a prosecutor. And I, I just, I don't see myself erring on that side. I wouldn't have done that. Yeah, if you're just tuning in, we're having a conversation today about there are 12 states in, in that, well, first of all, the United States population for African-Americans is about 13%, around 42 million people. But there are 12 states where the incarceration, the prison population of 12 states is 50% or higher african American. And Virginia, ladies and gentlemen, is one of those 12, which is partly why we're having this conversation today. Why are the rates, incarceration rates for Black people so much higher in these states and, and across the board, really, when our population in this country is only 13%? Dr. Alvin Lyons, doctor, what the article also said was that there's other states where the black to white prison ratio mm -hmm. is nine to one or higher. Mm -hmm. That means nine black people for every one white person or higher than that. And these states are California, Connecticut, Iowa, Maine, Minnesota, New Jersey, and Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And New Jersey, by the way, has the highest rate of black to white incarceration rates at 12 to one mm -hmm. or higher. Dr. Alvin Lyons, doctor, you deal with this stuff. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts on this? Well, I think it was really interesting and the article goes further to say, truly meaningful reform to the criminal justice system cannot be accomplished without the acknowledgement of its racist underpinnings. And that I think is the thing that, you know, we try to have conversations around the issue without having conversations directly through the issue, right? And, you know, as, you know, Commonwealth Attorney Bell said, you know, my big brother said, there, there, there's, there are two elements of culpability that exist inside of this simultaneously. You know, you almost have to surgically dissect them because they are so closely linked one to another, right? So our crime rates that are us more often than ever destroying, harming, violating one another, that's legitimate crime, okay? Like, so, you know, we're not, we're not trying to, we can't use racism as an excuse for why we treat each other the way we treat each other, right? So I still want, if somebody violates somebody I love, if somebody violates anybody, I want you to deal with the consequences of the decision that you made, right? But for those of us who really want to examine the root issue behind that, we can, it's very difficult to separate the fact that race does play even into crime rates, right? So if you're talking about lack of access, you're talking about lack of opportunity, as soon as you start talking about scarcity, you're going to see increased crime rates. You know, if people are gonna do what it takes to be able to eat. People are gonna do what it takes to be able to survive. And unfortunately, if that means I have to take from you in order for me to survive, for a lot of folks, that is life, right? So that when we're talking about the basic need of humans for self-preservation, 
and you are systematically reducing their access to viable opportunities that don't require them to commit acts of, of criminality in order to do so, that's where we start talking about how those two issues are so closely aligned. They're not an excuse. So let us be crystal clear. We are not saying that racism is the excuse for why we are destroying one another. We are saying that the increased rates of violence and criminality that we see inside of our communities have systemic components inside of it, right? So the, it's that's the, the challenging conversation that we have to have because we've even been honest about this when we're talking. We're like, okay, if it's poverty by all by itself, why if I look at the projects versus if I look at the trailer park, are the, the crime levels still higher in the projects when we are equally broke, okay? Like, so why, is, why are we still seeing that? And what I will say to you is if someone was really gonna look at this, the, the social psychology behind that, if I take a man out of, the, out of the trailer park and I clean him up and I walk him through Target, he is more likely to be assumed to be a manager a CEO, a business owner, a professional, just by virtue of the fact that we put some clean clothes on him. But if I take a dude out of the projects, I could put him in a suit and people will still assume that at best, maybe he's somebody's pastor, but they do not assume him to be owner of anything, CEO of anything, running anything more often than not. So the psychology of inferiority that is laid upon the experience of people of color that mm -hmm. exists under just underneath the surface creates this constant mechanism inside of the way that we operate that changes the way the thing plays. And what I will say, and then I will pause, is that we've also talked about this too. One of the things where it's a personal ownership issue for us, because we always believe in culpability on, the, on this show, we are about personal accountability, okay? We're not trying to ignore anything, but we are about personal accountability. One of the things that we have to do is what happened out there in terms of people's perceptions of our inferiority became what happened in here our own personal perceptions of inferiority, such that we don't value our own lives. And in turn, we are not valuing our brother or our sister. And that's why it's so easy to pull that trigger because that Negro didn't mean anything to you either. So when we start talking about black lives matter, black lives need to matter to black people too. You know, like, so while we, we, we screaming it, and I'm saying we as a community screaming it to white America, you need to be whispering it in the ear of your son, your brother, your nephew, your cousin, your sister. When, because the Black Lives Mattering isn't just about whether or not we're killing each other too. It's how many times are our men violating women? How many times are we abandoning our little boys and our little girls? Yeah. How many times are we turning our backs on each other? Mm -hmm. How many times would we rather be there for somebody else who's done nothing for us than be there for each other? How many times are we doing that? Because life is so much bigger than whether or not there's a heartbeat. Life is about quality. And we don't even extend to each other the quality of engagement that one another So we have a very big conversation that has to happen that the layers are so close together that it's almost like an onion and peeling them back is surgical. But the reality is that at some point, those of us who want to see change, we're going to have to talk about all the layers and we're gonna to have to own all the layers because if the success is outside of you then, and the failure is outside of you, we will always be victims inside of our own life stories. We gotta own the failure so that we can also own the success. And we've gotta be honest about where things are because if anything, if we learn how to cheat each other properly, you can't teach people to treat you different than you treat yourself. So can't we at least get that right? At least in slavery, we got that part right. We at least treated each other properly back then. But what happened? What happened, y'all? How did integration make us not value each other in ways that we valued each other more when we meant nothing to anybody else? So we got to own all kinds of stuff that folks don't like to talk about, but I'm here to keep it fair for everybody. We 
all have to own our stuff from inside your house, inside your church, to inside of your courtroom, to inside of your hospital, why the mortality rates are, are higher for women of color, to inside of every level of this, there has to be ownership. And that's where change begins. Say it. Yeah, listen, uh, Bishop Ray, um, you know this in church, you don't want to come behind somebody that just killed the pulpit. But uh, that, that's your assignment right now because we, we just need to go ahead and give Alvin a license. You know what I'm saying? Because she straight up preaching the gospel up in here today. But I, I want to I wanna say, Bishop, before I have you on, maybe some people are just tuning in. U.S. population, it, there's 13 to 14% African-American. We just said that there are 12 states in the land where the prison population of African-Americans is 50% or higher. And that Virginia is one of those 12. What we also know is that there are several states where the ratio of black to white is at least nine to one. Nine black people to one white person in prison. And we know that New Jersey, According to this article, and, and Jason, I hope you can put this article link in the chat so people can see it uh, and look at it for themselves. Uh, New Jersey has the highest ratio of at least 12 Blacks to one white in their state. But if that ain't enough, article also found that Black Americans are incarcerated in state prisons at nearly five times the rate of white Americans and Latinx people are 1.3 times as likely as whites to be in a state prison. So what Alvin is saying is true. The system that has been set up is working because that system ain't never been built for black people. Mm -hmm. So talk to us, Bishop. What are your thoughts on all this? Let me just add to, uh, to what Alvian is saying. And, uh, you know, let me also add the scriptures. Because <laughs> you know, Pastor Swan, they will always say on this show, y'all talk politics and education and all this other stuff. But what does the Bible have to say with all of that? Well, I got two scriptures, uh, Pastor uh, Law, and that is right there in Proverbs 19 and 23 and the other one. In 16 and 11, it talks about imbalanced weights, measures, and scales. Yeah. And it says that the Lord hates them yeah. because of the inequities that they cause in the lives of people. Yeah. So, you know, when you start to frame this by context, if heaven is upset with you because the imbalance is completely and totally gone awry, then at what point do you think we are not going to experience, you know, wrath that also has to come from heaven that we may see in culture in different areas? Let me mention three books that I'll to, to validate and to add some more substantiation to what Alvin is saying. If you have not read uh, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, Jim Crow, you need to go read that. If you have not studied the work by Marion Wright Adelman that talks about the cradle to the prison pipeline, from the third grade, they start building prisons based on the performance mm -hmm. of, in particular, African-American and Latino boys by way of their behavioral patterns at the principal's office. They can determine whether or not there's going to be a cell waiting for you. And by the way, in my opinion, that's a system that is making money the use of, I call it a lack of representation uh, through taxation, where we're going to automatically determine where we're going to put you and use the tax dollar to create it and then make money off of it with a public-private partnership. That's a broken system in and of itself. And if you have not taken time to read Reginald Horseman's Race and Manifest Destiny, please read those books. And uh, maybe, Jason, you can put them in the chat. Which is to say, you know, when, when I looked at this article that Pastor Law gave us, Pastor Swan, I started to think, wait a minute now, Virginia's got 8 million people with it, close to almost eight and a half with some of the economic booms and some of the, the, uh, the growth in some of the different areas that we've had, particularly here in Hampton Roads. And there are 3 million between at least Richmond and Virginia Beach, if not four to five. This is Hampton Roads planning district information. 
um, from about five or six years ago. And then I started to think, well, wait a minute now, are we sure that the incarceration rates, are we still that high? Uh, because this isn't slavery time, this isn't Jim Crow era, um, but when we start to talk about systemically, Virginia is the seedbed, we forget Richmond was the capital of the Confederacy. So when you start to look at all of that, from a systemic standpoint, the slave plantations, the overseers became members of the parole board. So it doesn't, it doesn't, it shouldn't shock us or surprise us in any way. I want to just shift it to who stands to gain if you look at Mary and Wright Oliver's work, who stands to gain as a result of creating these prisons? I mean, we got right here in Chesapeake, they created a whole new federal uh, penitentiary, state-based system, both federal and state, right here in Chesapeake and closed down several, several what I would call other preventative measures that could kept this from happening. So I'm just, I'm taking a look at it with much more introspection in terms of what is happening in terms of the amount of money that's being made with the creation of all of this. And is that, does that in and it of itself have an imbalanced weight measurement scale to it? You'd be surprised who sits on the board of what entities and what organizations that are involved in the prosecution of law, the defense of law, uh, and the creation of these dis different facilities. So, you know, all the way around, like she said, everybody got to own their stuff. And we in the church, we are culpable as well. Uh, because we haven't taken enough time to speak to these kinds of issues uh, for fear of losing what could be resources in our own coffers. So I'm right there with her, with Alvin and with, with Anton. We should not be surprised in a sense we should, but when we start looking at it systemically, maybe we should not be. Mm -hmm. And maybe yeah. we need to kind of lift up our voices a little bit more. And and just for a second, Kevin, just to, as a, a quick data point also to, to what Ray said, they also look at literacy rates. Whether or not you can read by third grade is another way in which they can measure the trajectory of you know what they ex where they right. expect you to be because of all of your benchmarking and all of your standardized testing and competencies. If you can't read by third grade, you will you will be years behind your cohort and it puts you in a very different situation. So I just want to add that one element also, it's important that our babies can read. Yeah, 100%. And Jason, you know, um, you're hearing these rates, state after state, high rates of, of black incarceration. Wisconsin leads the country one out of every 36 black residents in Wisconsin is in a state prison. That's mm -hmm. amazing considering Wisconsin really ain't that big. Mm -hmm. And also considering that Wisconsin is overwhelmingly white. But now you hearing all this stuff, Jason, what comes to mind? Uh, one word and it's, it's the village. Um, we have left our village, we have left the tenants that made us great. Um, and when I say us, um, no hate, no discrimination, but us as a people. Um, one of the reasons why um, Dr. Alvin Lyons, doctor has inspired me as, as well as my daughter. Um, education is power. Um, yes. Knowledge is power. Um, yes. We talk about being advocates for our babies in the school. One of my first jobs, I was an ED counselor, emotional dis disturbance counselor, and um, one of our locales. And what I would see overwhelmingly is um, our, our babies of color being removed from class for minor offenses because the teachers just didn't want to deal with them. Um, one, of, one of my heartbeats and one of my passions, the reason why I went back to school, and one of the reasons I'm getting some more certifications is I want to have a program that partners with the schools that removes the need for SIPs or, or uh, ISS. So that um, when you come to me, I'm remediating you, getting you back into the class. Then we can process later on through the arts, uh, whether it be music, poetry, um, reading, writing, basketball, stuff like that. 
we can use those things as a mechanism to inspire you, but we got to keep our babies in school um, because now, a, a, before COVID, I would go into the schools every Friday and um, I would read to the kids on an elementary level. Um, in the afternoon, I would go to either middle school or high school and sit and just help the teachers out because part of, part of the problem is classroom management. They don't have it. Um, but they don't. They also don't talk our vernacular. Um, the and I'm not going to use that word now. I'll use it later. Um, but I just feel like if we would go back, like um, Dr. Alvin and Dr. said, and take personal responsibility for our culpability in this whole thing, um, it's wrong. I mean, the system is what the system is, but we can't change the system until we're a part of the system. We can't change the system until we're sitting on those boards, until we doing what my brother Anton is doing, Commonwealth attorney. He's not a basketball player. Just because this dude's six, whatever, and a nice build, he, he's supposed to be an athlete, according to them. He, he, he's, a, he's a Commonwealth attorney. Uh, uh, Dr. Alvian, doctor, very attractive young lady. She should, be a, she should be a model. But no, she's a doctor into psychology, speaking into change. Um, and I'm going to say this, and, and y'all know this is God, but as intelligent as Dr. Swan is and the way he uh, <laughs> exegete the text, him and, and Bishop Johnson, the agrinutiousness of the vitality of what they do, they should not be doing that. But we have to change the, the mantle. And I say this and I close. Langston is one years old. He'll be two in January. I don't care how big that dude is. I don't care, you know, what they say he should be doing athletically. He will have a 4.2 GPA. He will go to he will go to college on a full ride for academics. If he's a ball player, cool. If he can hoop, cool. But academics will be where it is for him. Um, we have to get back to that because then we'll change our mindset. And, and I, I may upset some people, but look at Black Wall Street. We had our own system in place and see how rich we were back then. Why can't we have that same thing? We have more technology, more resources than we've ever had. And what we doing? TikTok challenges. We doing uh, uh, Tide Pod challenges. We uh, doing all this stupid stuff. But we can't leverage the technology that we have. Why are we not building apps? Why are we not building credit unions? Why are we not building universities? Why are our HBCUs going bankrupt? I'm a proud uh, a graduate of HBCU. You know, I love my home by the sea. It'll be a disservice that Langston and Layla can't go there. So I, I just really think that we need to agronish this foolishness. I just took agronutiousness and I made it into a verb. It, it's in the dictionary. Y'all need to go check it out. So, um, Dr. Swan, before someone asks the show about what we're talking about, bring us back in, man. I appreciate you using agriduciousness twice because that, that that helps my congregation who keep coming to me saying, you know, is that a real word? So I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Now, now, we've talked about the challenges. Now let's talk about possible solutions. And Come with the turn. I want to come back to you because this article also made some suggestions, and, and you are our legal represent, representation here. So, the reports made several recommendations, including the elimination of mandatory minimum sentences and discontinuing arrest for low level drug offenses. What are your thoughts on that? So, I, I never believe in just. Um, sweeping uh, a particular issue with a general brush. Because as I have said once, and I will say again, they are sociopaths that walk among us. Mm -hmm. They go to your church. Mm -hmm. They may even get, get into your pulpit if you let them and you're not <laughs> prayed up, okay? And so you need to be careful about having a general brush concerning the laws. And when you do that, because some of these laws absolutely were made to increase 
uh, incarceration rates, no question about that. And I think you need to address those laws. But when you start talking about gun violence, when you start talking about rape, when you start mm -hmm. talking about murder, I'm sorry, I want you off the street as long as I can keep you the street. Because when you can take someone's life on purpose, intentionally, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you thought about it and took their life simply because you mad, mm -hmm. no. Nah. You have forfeited your right to be among us. You gotta so go. you need to go. And there are mandatory minimums just for you. They have your name on it and we give them to you and they gift with their bow on them. Okay. So now, <laughs> no, that's, right. that's right. I said it. Uh, I said right. it. So, so you're not in favor of mandatory minimums. But no, you I didn't have... say that. No, I didn't say that. What I said, what I said, I clarify myself. Don't make me get Jay to put that word on you again. But see, <laughs> don't make me get him. I didn't say that. What I said is, I don't have a pro. I said you should you should be careful not to have a broad stroke of a brush concerning certain things. Mandatory minimums are one of them because there are some things I believe that you should have a mandatory minimum. If you hurt somebody with a gun on purpose, there should be a mandatory minimum for you. If you rape somebody, there should be a mandatory minimum for you. If you murder somebody on purpose, because murder means you purposely did it, there should be a mandatory minimum for you. Now, I don't have a problem in telling the judge, give it to him, please. So, you know, that's that's my take. However, however, what I do believe is a viable solution is the right to choose. Because what people forget over and over and over again is that every district attorney is elected. Every one of them. And just like I was upset about how I believe that race may have played a part in that young boy, because he's 22 years old. So I know he's a man technically, but he's still, you know, he's young enough to be my son. He's a young boy to me. Mm -hmm. And for him to be arrested, to be given a felony, and to be taken away from his kids, I think that is not the right thing to do. Now, again, my 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 opinion. You know, doesn't make, make it legal, doesn't make it uh, everything, but my opinion. But that's the type of prosecutor I am. I'm a prosecutor who believes in dealing with criminality, where people are intentionally committing wrongdoings, not when people make horrific mistakes. And as a result of the horrific mistake, you criminalize it. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. And so you got prosecutors who criminalize mistakes. Mm -hmm. Not criminal things, but mistakes. There's a difference. And they do that based sometimes, many times, on race, class, or social status. That is how you get rid of that food. You get rid of that food by going to the, put up to the polls and you vote that joker out. And here's the other thing. When you get upset about these kids getting arrested and talking about all these mass incarceration, well, guess what? You don't even have a voice if you don't even vote because you can't even be a part of a jury to decide somebody's fate because they pull, they pull the jury from the voter registration pools. So if you are not a part of voting, you don't have a say in that. If you got a problem with an officer shooting somebody and you're saying that, hey, why they shoot him? but you don't get the opportunity to sit on that grand jury to decide whether they should even get charged. Why? Because they pull from the voter registration pool. So again, voting is, uh, to me, the number one factor in being able to make that difference. You can all pick right. it all day long until you got holes in your shoes. I don't care. It ain't going to work. You need to go to that poll. That will work. Yeah, we're going to talk about that because we know election season is here. And, and I want to get into that, but I, I just got a quick question for you. So you did mention mandatory minimums. It depends is what you're saying in certain yes. circumstances, right? Yes. But it also recommended about lower level drug offenses that you, you shouldn't even bother with those. And I know that there's been conversation before marijuana yeah. became legal about that. So what's your thought on 
lower level drug offenses? Well, I'm not a proponent of legalizing lower level uh, drug offenses, but I was a proponent of decriminalizing, which is the difference. Decriminalized means there is no uh, criminal penalty if you're caught with these things. But do I believe in legalizing low level drugs like marijuana or whatever? No, I never believed in that. I just believe that it should be decriminalized. I don't believe that there should be a penalty for it. And I'll tell you why. The reason I didn't believe that is because I, I see marijuana the same way I see alcohol. In fact, I actually see marijuana in a better light because marijuana has some municipal purposes to it. People can use that CBD uh, oil and they can, uh, you, you talk to some of these older people, they'll tell you they use that oil. <laughs> they'll put it on their aches and their pain. Or younger people, works. or younger people. Or, or younger people, okay, I, I, I won't try to name nobody, but you know, there it is, there it is. But it, they'll tell you it works. You know, someone told me just yesterday about that. And it was like, it really works. And so you can't do that with alcohol. All alcohol can do is get you drunk and nasty. That's right. it. So I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, but it's legal. You know, it's legal. <laughs> it's legal. So I'm like, if you go, if you go let alcohol be out on the street, you know, if you're gonna let the wolf out, then you might as well just go ahead and, and, and deal with the other issue. And so that's why I had a problem with marijuana being illegal. Now, again, I, I still don't believe you should, well, I should say not legal, but you should be able to decriminalize, but it's legal now. So I, I don't have no heartburn over it. I really don't. Mm -hmm. The only issue I have is young people getting access to it. And because there are no dispensaries here, other than for medical purposes, right. drug dealer is getting rich mm -hmm. because the drug dealer in under Virginia setup, you can have up to an ounce and there's no penalty. But if you have between an ounce and a pound or a little bit of a pound, it's only a misdemeanor and there is no criminal sanction. So literally a drug dealer can have less than a pound of marijuana selling his tail off, making all kind of move, money <laughs> and get no criminal penalty for it. And that is not good for our community. And that's the reason why I got a problem with it. All right. So we've heard from Pastor Law yes. on, his, on his day job. And if you're just tuning in, we're having an honest conversation about the system. And we talk about the system all the time here on the show. And we have proof to you all today that the system is working because the system was always designed to be built against black people. Mm -hmm. So again, United States population, African-American is 13 to 14% max. In 12 states in the country, the prison population in those states for African-Americans is at 50% or above, mm -hmm. Virginia being one of those states. Mm -hmm. In several other states, the ratio of black to white inmates in prison at higher than nine to one, black to white. New Jersey is the highest with 12 to one at a minimum, 12 blacks for every one white that's incarcerated in prison. We also know that state penitentiary, state prisons, in most of the United States, five times more likely to have a black person than a white person in prison. We know that, that's what this article is talking about. So now we're talking about solutions. I open up the floor to, to any of you, because we're running out of time here. The show has gotten real good and I don't want to just give one person the opportunity. But there have been some suggestions in, in this article about solutions. But is there anything we can do to address the system and, and find a way to dismantle the system? Because again, the system is doing what it's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So how do we address the system? Or can we change the system? Or is what Pastor Law is saying, voting is the way that we dismantle and change the system. Is there something else we can do? Any of you, you can go. Yeah, so let me hop in real quick too, because I really want to on something that Anton said when he was talking about how, you know, there's, when, when a mistake is made in communities, when it's a person from the community 
occurs often, a mistake is elevated to criminality. And I just wanna to speak to the fact that we also see the converse where criminality is, is de-escalated to mistake. And a perfect example of a, a gentleman who was about the same age as the individual that Attorney Bell was referencing was the Brock Turner case. If you remember that case, he was a swimmer and a, a high level athlete. And I think it was in Stanford, if I remember correctly, who raped an unconscious girl. And the judge's response, Judge Pensky, I think it was, Persky, as a matter of fact, response is a prison sentence would have a severe impact on him. I think he will not be a danger to others. Now this boy done just raped a girl and the judge doesn't want him to go to jail because the judge sees himself or can relate to who the, the, who the assailant is inside of the situation, right? So the thing that's very interesting is that if we don't find ourselves behind benches, we don't have anybody who's looking at these individuals and can see their nephew, their cousin, their son, their niece, their brother. They don't, they don't see, they don't see themselves inside of that. It's the same issue that we see inside of school systems. Why it matters having black teachers. Because when those children are behaving like little black kids may behave, then when when you're used to what that looks like, it doesn't, it's just a regular kid behavior. It's not outside of the normal. It's just the way that black children, when they get upset, how they might act might be a little bit different than how white children may act. There are cultural differences, how Asian children express themselves when they get angry. There are cultural, there are legitimate cultural differences. But if we are not present inside of these systems, then we are judged by someone that doesn't recognize what is normative and not normative for us. So if every elephant is judging all of the eagles, they're going to judge eagle to elephant differently than elephants to elephants are going to judge. We got to make sure the system has us represented inside of it. So when I, and I bring that up to speak to not only a, a case that represented the opposite of what Anton was saying, but to speak to what the solutions are. When Jason was speaking to why education is so important is that education equals access and access equals opportunity and opportunity changes outcomes. Because if we are inside of the spaces that are making the decisions, then the outcomes could look different. And that is not to let every black criminal run free because I'm locking your butt up too. So it's not about that because in, and people are under the mistaken impression that black people will just be passive with all black people. No, actually, we could be tougher because how dare you disrespect your family name like that acting a fool out in these streets. We want to spank other people's children. Okay. Like, so please know that we're all about equal accountability. That that's a farce to believe that we'll be passive. It is to say, however, that when you're represented inside of these spaces when we are voting, when we are leading, when we are speaking, when we are judging, that means that there is a better opportunity for balanced outcomes, for equity in outcomes. But for as long as we are not doing what it takes to be present inside of these spaces, we cannot look to someone else to create equity for us. We've gotta be responsible for creating that for ourselves. And when you are educated, you also spend the time to know what the system should be affording you. And when it is not affording you those things, this is when you get upset. If you don't know the law, you can't argue about the law when it's not being appropriately adjudicated. You can't speak to those things. But if you know the law, you could speak in a, when it's inappropriately being utilized or applied. So that is why they say you want to hide stuff from Black folk, put it in a book. Look, let me tell you what, we better start opening up some of these both digital and natural books so that we know some stuff. There's a reason why white slave owners did not want us reading, doing math, because they know to think is to have power. So we've got to make sure that we, you know, it, America needs to think again. Black America needs to get, we need to fall in love with thinking so that we make sure that we are changing what is happening to us. So that's what I would say in terms of what do we do? Boy, open up a book. Start reading, start getting some information, start having some conversations with people about something other than TikTok. 
right, why, why don't we start having some substantive exchanges so that we are educating and forming and empowering one another. And it's not against our white brothers and sisters. It's about just elevating to meet them. Yeah, I, listen, and to that point, let me tie both of y'all's in together. And then Bishop, I'll come to you. So voting is important because voting, what, but one thing that we don't do in our community is that we don't leverage our vote, right? And so we have people coming in our communities and all we do is say, hey, we happy to see you and we just vote. And, and then they can go back later on and do whatever legislation that they want because we're not following up, we're not reading, we're looking to make sure that they're doing what they say they're gonna do. So let me just give an example. One of the reasons why Republicans love Trump, some of them even to this day, is because he ran on the notion of Supreme Court justices. Right. That if, if you vote for me, I will make sure that we put Supreme Court justices that are conservative on the bench, right? And so he delivered on that. And even though he didn't win the second election, his legacy based on the Supreme Court will last for years. Yes. Because he got three judges on the Supreme Court. Yes. Decades. And now you got Roe versus Wade that's up. You got all these other issues that are up. Because why? He ran on, if you vote for me, I'll make sure I get the judges that you want on the bench. Yes. See, this is what we don't do in, in our community. We don't leverage our votes. We just let yeah. people come in, have all kinds of conversations, but what do we want? Mm -hmm. And what are we going to say to the people that we vote for? If you don't support my agenda, I ain't voting for you. And I don't care what party you to. I don't care what party. Okay, like, this ain't got nothing to do don't even matter. with no about agenda. And let me say, Dr. Harvey's the president of Hampton University. He has a quote that he uses on uh, WHOV, which is what we're on. Say, I ain't got no permanent friends. No permanent only permanent interest. Yeah, that's all I got. Yep. When do we start acting like that as a company? Where my interest and the, the, so if we know the system is working against us, then when do we say, I ain't voting for you unless you bring me a seat at the table? Mm -hmm. or I'm not going to vote for you unless you address the system that keeps us in prison. Mm -hmm. And if you ain't willing to talk about that, I ain't willing to talk but about I have you. I don't talk to you about. There's nothing to talk about. Ain't nothing to talk about. <laughs> That's how you start changing the game. But we, we don't read and we want to wear TikTok, watch TikTok, and we just want to look good all the time and we ain't knowledgeable of what's going on. That's why these systems continue to operate. That is a fact. You got to wake up to this stuff. Bishop Ray, go ahead, man. We're almost out of time. You, you, I mean, you got your hat on backwards, getting ready to land. You landed the plane and went backwards. Everything. I mean, Al Sharpton done showed up at Pastor Kevin Swan today. Oh, uh, speaking uh, but you know we got you know the church is also yeah. culpable in this in the sense that and i think this is a, a black parents issue as well uh, we gotta start training our our children from the perspective of no you don't just read or or aspire to go to college to get a job we've got to look at becoming those who employ others yes. and creatively learning how to be able to think to create something that me that meets a need uh, that doesn't currently exist for where we're going. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to have a um, kind of a 50 year, you know, outlook view of where am I going to be 45, 30, 25 years from now and begin to start training our young people to start saying these are the industries that are going to not only be lucrative, but that will also meet needs. And so as you meet needs, I don't want you to just be at the table, but I want you to own the wood and the chairs and everything else at the table so that they have to come and pay you in order to be able to sit down on what you own. And I think therein lies the difference of how we'll begin to change some of the trajectory of how of what we're going to look like by 2030 and 2040 and that kind of thing. The last thing I would say is I think also we got to come back to Jesus in this sense because, you know, they, they say we don't talk about the Bible and the scriptures <laughs> enough, uh, Pastor Swan and Pastor Law and Alvin. And that is Luke 19 and 10. Jesus intentionally goes to the house of Zacchaeus to have fellowship and to have dinner with him. 
knowing that he is one of the chief tax collectors that is the biggest sinner in the city and calls him a son of Abraham and then does this in the text. He says, the son of man came to seek and to save that which is lost. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm writing it, I would say the son of man came to seek and to save them who are. But Jesus doesn't say that. He says that which is, which means that Jesus not only wants Zacchaeus, but he also wants the system that Zacchaeus is a part of that causes him to participate in this kind of behavior. And from the church, we've got to kind of have the panoramic view where we look at both sides, the soul, and then look at what causes the soul to participate in what it participates in that separates it from God. And I think we're a little bit too one-sided in that recall. That causes for us, and we ain't got enough time to do this, Pastor Law, so I ain't even gonna look at you. That causes us to have to take a look at us because you can't call out sin that you participate in and I'm done. I ain't, go, I ain't going all the way in that today. I'm just going to stop right there. Yeah, we just glad Pastor Law didn't cuss today. That's all we proud of. You know, <laughs> we, 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 we did all the way out. We just happy he ain't cuss today. Wow. <laughs> Don't believe that you defamed me. He defamed me. You can call the pastor's hoes the last Weeks, what you talking about? I ain't called pastors hoes. They called themselves hoes when they walked up into that pool and got their hoes. You done messed it up. Stop. You done messed it up. You done oh, cussed okay, me. Okay, I'm, I'm just saying. Don't push me. Don't push me. No, no, we got to go, y'all. I'm just we got saying. Out of time. We got a time. Thank y'all for tuning in. As always, be blessed to be a blessing to someone else. This is Smooth 88.1 <laughs> WHOV iHeartRadio. Right here, y'all, on Facebook Live. Y'all pray for passing, y'all. You got a cussing spirit. <laughs>